Well, the world knows what a short squeeze is, or at least GameStop does, and apparently COVID isn't a reason for California and other left-led cities and states to remain closed anymore. Plus, Governor Cuomo may be in some hot water with his state's attorney general. These topics, plus our one-on-one -on -one with Democrat strategist and Biden campaign surrogate Kevin Walling, today on The BizPo Show. <music> Welcome to the BizPo Show, a place where politics and business collide in a way that we hope is both entertaining and enlightening. I'm Seth Denson, coming to you live from Dallas, Texas, joined by my buddy up in New York City, Dan Geltrude, America's accountant. Dan, how are you, buddy? I'm doing great, Seth. I have to tell you, I am really excited about today because I think people may be anticipating that all we're going to talk to are conservatives and Republicans, but that's not going to be the case. Yeah, there was a network out there at one point that, that that said fair and balanced, right? That was kind of the tagline. Well, we want that to be the case here. And you know what? Listen, we're talking about the intersection of business and politics, and we have a Democrat in the White House. So if you don't think that we probably need to hear what some Democrats are saying around both business and politics, well, let's hope you're not in the business world, right? Uh, so yeah, our guest today, uh, Kevin Wallach, man, this is, he's a fantastic guy. Uh, he's one of those that I think, whether you're on the right or the left, you're gonna sit back after our discussion and go, okay, I like this guy, uh, right? At the end of the day, we're all Americans. We need to find ways to, to collaborate with one another. Kevin's certainly one of those that helps make that happen. And I am really looking forward to chatting with him. So now, Seth, listen, everything we talk about as far as colors has a tendency to be uh, red and blue. But we're going to focus in to start with on green, right? So a lot of news coming out of Wall Street, particularly about GameStop and, and the term short, shorting. And I can't tell you how many people have been asking me about that, but why don't you give our audience some insight as to what it means when someone is short? Yeah, just this last week, right? We heard uh, about this new term, or at least for many that are outside of maybe the investor investing world, a new term called shorting stock. Uh, and, 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 and it's something now that much of the world is familiar with, but maybe much of the world still doesn't understand because it's kind of it's kind of confusing, so let's just explain it. Yeah, so when a company wants to short a stock, right? So let's just talk about the fundamentals of investing 101, right? Is you want to understand the businesses you're investing in. So a lot of investment houses, especially institutional investors, will hire analysts, people to come in and look at the fundamentals of a business. And if a business is under evaluated, right? An analyst might look at that and say, that's a good stock buy, right? Because maybe they're, sh they're trading at a price that's going to go up in large part because the fundamentals of their business is good. Maybe their market outlook is good. So these analysts, these really smart people are looking at things and saying, we should invest in this stock. Let's go buy it. The opposite of that though, is when maybe a stock is overvalued or a, a, a business isn't valued in a way that is in alignment with maybe its business fundamentals or its future. And so what happens is, and this has been going on for decades, is that investors can do what's called short the stock. And what that means is that instead of buying the stock, they're actually just borrowing it. So they're borrowing the stock with a guarantee to buy that stock at a set date in the future. Now, once they borrow that stock, they're guaranteeing to buy it. They have to buy it. The idea for shorting a stock is that I'm going to borrow it at a price that's here, and I'm going to wait for a market correction based on my own analysis that says the stock is overvalued. And so let's just assume we have a stock that's, say, priced at $20. And a Wall Street analyst looks at this and says, that stock is overpriced. It probably should be around maybe $5 or $10. Well, then an investor may go, I'm going to short that stock. I'm going to borrow the shares at 20. I'm going to hold on to it and, and, and make sure I make it. And I'm going to wait to actually purchase the stock until it's dropped. And I get to profit off the difference. Hedge fund managers have been doing this for years. They've made billions off this. Okay. A short squeeze though is when that stock goes the other direction based on potential influence. 
And that's what we saw this past week when it came to GameStop. So GameStop, for example, many analysts that I talked to across Wall Street were saying GameStop, while priced in the $40 to $50 range, probably should have been closer to $20. And that's in large part because they're highly uh, based on retail sales. They're in an industry that is moving more digital to gain downloads versus actual having to buy a tangible game for a gaming system. And so maybe it was overvalued. And so hedge fund managers had poured billions <laughs> into this, right? And, and really had shorted this stock to the tune of more stock that was even available. I think it was 140% of available stock, right? So they were doing this. Well, a bunch of uh, day traders got together and started chatting through uh, cell phones and Reddit and some of these other sites and said, no, we don't like what hedge funds are about to do to this stock. We, we want to prop up GameStop. So they started buying it. And overnight, it was a stock success. And thus, that's what's called a short squeeze. And so these hedge funds that are highly leveraged into this now have to make do on their short. And they got to buy these, the, these stocks and these shares and mind you, these shares were at $40, $50. They're now over $300, or at least they were by the end of last week. And so that's the issue here. These hedge fund managers, they're going to lose billions in the process. And a lot of day traders are going, yep, we got you guys. Well, there's a little bit more to it as far as who you're cheering for here. Because this whole situation has been... Uh, compared to David and Goliath, right? So the, the, the David is the, is the small investor, and obviously the Goliath is this big, bad hedge fund that, that manipulates the market and, and makes all this money. So people are thinking, hey, score one for the little guys. Well, not so fast, because what you need to understand is, is as the stock is going up, at some point in time, the music stops and when it does there is a lot there are a lot of people that ultimately don't have a chair now what happens to those people well they lose their money and what i'm saying here is although there's a lot of hedge funds that are going to take a beating there's also a lot of small investors that got caught up with the shiny object of watching some of these stocks go higher and higher and higher, but they're buying in late. They're trying to time the market. That doesn't work. That doesn't work for the best on Wall Street, let alone these day traders or novice investors who think all of a sudden they're going to get rich quick. It doesn't work that way, Seth. So what's catching the attention of the SEC the federal government is to say, wait a minute, there's some manipulation going on. Was anything done illegally? Well, maybe not, but it doesn't seem right. And, and there needs to be an investigation to see what happened, because a lot of people are going to take a big hit financially, and they shouldn't have. And let me make one more point. If these hedge funds get in financial trouble, do we end up with another too big to fail situation? Because that's where we end up going. So if you're going to be cheering against the hedge funds and some of the, the big players on Wall Street for getting burned, well, if they get burned too bad, that may be coming out of our pocket. Yeah, listen, I, I think you hit the nail on the head, Dan, as we start to think about was this manipulation or influencing stock? I, I guess time will tell, and, and no doubt that the SEC is going to look into this and see if there was a violation of Section 9 of the SEC Act, right? Uh, and, and, and again, we won't know. And you know what? Maybe we'll never know. They could dive into this and, and, and really have a hard time making their way through it. But you bring up a fantastic point, and I'm glad you did, because... I fear what's going on in the investing world right now is, is more emotion than information. And, and we see that happening a lot um, when uh, you know, we're looking at these new app-based uh, trading platforms like Robinhood, for example, 
that utilizes gamification and you almost get awards and good jobs uh, for making trades through it. And again, it's this gamification that I think almost like social media, we get these endorphin rushes based on likes and comments and, and now Robinhood has capitalized on that. And I think that's a scary place that can create some real damage down the road for people that aren't really informed in the market. And, and that's a scary place. I hope that as, as we kind of come out of this, that uh, people don't get tied up in the emotion. Because as I mentioned at the beginning, the fundamentals for companies like GameStop that led these you know, billion dollar hedge funds to short them, those fundamentals haven't changed. Those guys are not uh, they're not unsavvy investors. They're making these shorts because they know what's going on. They're looking at these. These are smart business people, right? And the reasons they made those shorts, those haven't changed. And eventually, that stock price at where it is is likely going to come down. And is it going to be too late for some of these people that got involved? Well, what's, what social media is is doing to some extent here, Seth, is they are turning Wall Street into a casino. But this isn't a casino where you go in and you bet your money and you lose. There's a domino effect here. So when you had, let's say, a herd investment group, right, because that's what really happened here. There were herd investors, all these small retail investors, day traders, whatever you want to call them all got together and decided to go in one direction. But that that gambling, per se, that they were doing, well, that has implications across the world. This isn't going to Las Vegas for a weekend and blowing all your money. This is having an impact on the financial markets and literally on economies throughout the world. So we need to be really careful in looking at this, and this is one of the, the downsides of what social media can do. And I'm thinking that this isn't the end of this, Seth. I think there is going to be far-reaching impact of all of this. And the only way it's going to be addressed is ultimately su through some type of regulation. But what regulation, uh, we have to be concerned about over-regulation because the government has a tendency to overreact, and I think that's the danger that we're looking at with this whole GameStop situation. Yeah, no doubt. Like as you mentioned, man, anytime the government can find its, its way into something, they do just that. Hey, when we come back, our one-on-one -on -one with Democratic strategist Kevin Walling today on the BizPo Show. Welcome back to the BizPo Show. Well, the Biden administration has wasted no time getting to work. The president campaigned on accomplishing a lot during his first 100 days, and he's certainly working to deliver on his commitments. As expected, we've seen a significant shift in policy from the Trump administration. So what does this mean to you, and what can we expect both short and long term from our new president? For better insights, we're excited to welcome a man that likely knows more about this than most. He's Democratic campaign strategist who also served as a national Biden campaign surrogate, Kevin Walling. Kevin? Welcome to the BizPo Show. Hey, Dan. Hey, Seth. Good to be with you. Congratulations on the new show. Hey, thanks, man. We're excited to have you here. Well, listen, let's dive right in. Uh, you know, President Biden's been busy. <laughs> he's, he's signed more executive he orders has. and actions uh, in his first few days than uh, really the last dozen of his predecessors combined. So, you know, why such a large focus on executive orders as opposed to engagement with the legislature? Yeah, Seth, it's a good question. I think, you know, the Biden campaign and, and team uh, wanted to hit the ground running, wanted to show a man in charge in terms of uh, moving forward on all these actions. You know, I'll note, you know, this is uh, the, kind of the hallmark of when one party takes over the presidency from the other. We always see this kind of flurry of activity early on. Now, is it a lot more than what we've seen in the past? Absolutely. Uh, but again, when you compare, uh, you know, the Trump years, the four years, you saw about 220 or so executive actions. That's more than double what we saw uh, during the first four years of the Obama administration. So I think this is a trend that you're going to see continuing when one party takes over, uh, that this is the way to really reverse some of the policies uh, of a previous administration. You know, Kevin, I, I have a, a, a question for you that I think everyone can agree as far as Republicans and Democrats, and that relates to the COVID virus 
and and how we conquer this thing. So it seems that goal number one for the Biden administration has been to to really attack and set as a minimum 100 million vaccines within the first 100 days. Now, of course, some people jumped on that and said, well, we're already at that point. And, and of course, the president turned around and said, well, we want to do even better than that. The question becomes, we have Fi Pfizer and Moderna that are both working on these vaccines. And right now, they're producing about 4.3 million per week. And in order for uh, the Biden administration to meet the goal of 100 million within 100 days, they're actually going to have to get up to about 7.5 million. So they're behind right now. So the question becomes, is the Biden administration going to be able to keep that promise when they're relying on Pfizer and Moderna to be able to ultimately deliver the product? Yeah, Dan, it's a good question. You know, I, I think, you know, the Biden uh, administration wanted to set that ambitious agenda, put it out there uh, and, and hopefully deliver on that for the American people. So I think they're confident they can reach that number. You know, we've seen in the last week some conversations with other pharmaceutical companies in talks with Pfizer to use uh, some of the vaccine information to produce uh, their own uh, uh, vaccines as part of uh, the, the kind of uh, protected scientific information with that vaccine from Pfizer. So that's encouraging, right? If we can get more pharmaceutical companies uh, producing that Pfizer vaccine, I think that'll be a good thing. Uh, I know you'll, you, you've will you talked about uh, the president uh, enacting the WPA is, is war production authority uh, to increase uh, production when it comes to our supply chain, uh, which is a critical component. But I think what you're seeing out of the Biden administration is at least a bit of transparency. They've had a number of briefings with their COVID team uh, and and I think you're seeing Republican governors and, and Democratic governors alike giving this early administration some top marks when it comes to uh, at least uh, keeping them in the loop in terms of what's coming down the pike. So I think that will hopefully uh, get more shots in arms. But it is, you know, Dan, as you say, a really ambitious uh, number. And I hope that the Biden administration uh, can, can deliver on it. Well, I think it, it, it really is something that the entire country uh, red or blue should be uniting behind. So uh, let me let me ask you, you know, uh, Joe Biden has really spent his entire career touting his blue collar growing up from Scranton, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And and clearly that's a connection that he he tries to make with with voters. So now that he has reached the pinnacle of his political career as president, what do you think he can do realistically to be able to help the working class that are out there that are clearly hurting because of the pandemic? Yeah, it's a great question, uh, Dan. I spent a lot of time on the trail uh, with the president and uh, where he talked about being that scrappy kid from Scranton, Pennsylvania and, and Claymont, Delaware. I could usually uh, give his, uh, his stump speech from heart because it really touted those kind of humble beginnings uh, growing up in those communities, talking about his father losing his job, taking the longest uh, uh, journey up those stairs to tell them that they had to move. Um, so I think what you're seeing out of uh, the early stages, at least, is you know an emphasis on infrastructure spending. We talked a lot about that during the four years of the Trump administration, but really didn't get a deal with uh, House and, and uh, Senate Republicans and Democrats on that with President Trump. He's hopeful to move that along. You saw, you know, Secretary, former Secretary Kerry, talking about that as part of the climate response, and, and I'm sure we'll talk about that too uh, in terms of some of the actions we saw out of the administration last week alone on climate, but but they're tying it really into a jobs issue uh, where they want to put forward an economy that's built to last. He talked about building back better. That was a whole premise uh, of uh, of his campaign and restoring the, the middle class. So that's obviously near and dear to his heart, uh, but it's not just about building the jobs right now that we're seeing that, that are uh, in such high demand, but what, where, where are the industries of the future uh, that this administration can, can be promoting? Because again, you know, tax cuts won't get us there alone. Relief packages won't get us alone. It's all about jobs and job creation. Uh, and I think that's what this president is going to be focused like a laser beam on over these next four years. You know, Kevin, uh, you know, Dan addressed it with his question about uh, the president's blue collar roots uh, and growing up in Scranton. But and, and that really was the position, it seemed like, for a number of years for the Democratic Party, right? The, the, the party of the working class. But it seems like over the last few yeah. election cycles, at least uh, maybe in the last couple of midterms into this election cycle, uh, 
the Democrats have really changed uh, as the party of the common man and now in some ways have found themselves maybe more aligned as the party of the urban elite. Uh, this obviously led to the rise of Trumpism in 2016. So, you know, what steps could a Biden administration take to combat this going forward? Yeah, Seth, that's a, that's a really good question. You know, between six and eight million Americans voted for Barack Obama either once or twice and then voted for Donald Trump. Many of those are the working class folks that felt disillusioned with what they'd seen from the Democratic Party in the past, and the Republican Party in the past. I would argue that the Republicans are also going through a similar kind of series. You know, you look at Donald Trump's uh, first cabinet, right? Half of them uh, of the cabinet secretaries were, were millionaires in the hundreds of millions or even billionaires, a little bit out of touch uh, with working class folks, um, because I think both parties are struggling with that in terms of messaging uh, to those communities. But certainly we need to do a better job of that uh, as Democrats, I think, you know, working class folks helped put uh, Joe Biden over the top in some of those key states like Pennsylvania, like Georgia, like Arizona. Uh, but what we need to do as a party is also, while we're at the same time elevo elevating voices like AOC that gets a lot of attention, we also need to be elevate elevating voices like Connor Lamb that represents a rural district in, in Pennsylvania uh, as a Democrat who's putting forward kind of more moderate positions that's willing to work across party lines with Republicans to build some kind of consensus because we can't lose hold of those key voters as well. It's a really good question and something that I think Democrats are gonna be really focusing on in terms of protecting their gains that they saw um, in 2020, but we also lost a few of those key seats in some of those rural and, and uh, suburban areas because of that kind of messaging, I think, Seth. Yeah, you know, you brought her up, uh, AOC, for example. And listen, the right has their new young guns and, and Representative Madison Cawthorn and some of these others. Uh, but it does seem that in both parties, we're seeing this movement further to the fringes, maybe, or at least the, 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 the far right or the far left, or maybe what is now the middle right and middle left. Uh, but, you know, both parties are going to be challenged with this going forward because I think there is a, a moderate uh, voice out there that is yearned for by both parties. So as a Democratic strategist, how are you talking to people within the DNC to say, hey, you know, AOC has her following and certainly presents her ideas uh, in a very eloquent way, both on Twitter and in front of the camera. But how do we solve, if you were advising those in the DNC, uh, to make sure that we're addressing those concerns of the moderates? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think it's not a one-size-fits-all strategy in terms of the national level, but we've got to recruit and find people that are representative of those districts. I, like I said, I brought up uh, Connor Lamb, uh, who's a former military veteran, a uh, small business owner, moderate guy uh, that ran uh, and won in a, in a Republican-held district for a long time. He didn't talk about uh, far-left policies. He didn't talk about the Green New Deal. He talked about delivering results uh, for that district. So it can't be a national approach. I think we need to find and elevate uh, voices from within uh, districts and areas that, that really want to represent those people, because I, I do have that similar fear. You know, I'm, uh, you know, 10 years ago, I helped start a group called No Labels uh, that worked to find uh, folks somewhere in the middle, Republicans, Democrats, independents, that could have an honest conversation across party lines, because that's what I want to return to as a Democrat. You know, and that's why I think Joe Biden was actually successful. Uh, in both in the primary and the general election. He spent 36 years in the Senate, you know, before the craziness with Donald Trump and, and Lindsey Graham and all that. You saw Lindsey Graham in tears talking about his relationship uh, with Joe Biden. I want to return to that uh, in Washington, where you have those kind of consistent relationships built on trust. But again, it's all about finding authentic voices, I think, on the local level uh, that really represent those communities, both on the Republican side. And that's what I'm going to be pushing for on the Democratic side as well. As well. Kevin, I'd like to uh, bring up a hot topic, no pun intended. Uh, <laughs> let, let's talk about climate, right? So sure. certainly there is a big push from the left and a lot of pressure being put on President Biden related to we got to do something about climate change. Now, I'm not a scientist. I, d I don't exactly know what's causing it. And I guess there there is a human element, and to the extent that there is a human element that is contributing to climate change, I think we should address it. However, there is a balance here, and I, I think there are a lot of people out there that clearly want you know something done about climate change, but at the same time, they're not looking to significantly disrupt the U.S. economy. 
So we look at what Joe Biden has done immediately related to the Keystone Pipeline. And, and, and that, I think you recognize, has a lot of people concerned because it relates to jobs. Now, uh, John Kerry talked about, well, we're going we're gonna to be shifting those people into other areas. I don't think it's as easy, easily done as it is to say it. So, you know, what do you think the Biden administration is going to be able to do to be able to strike the balance? Because going way to the left on this, I think he, he's going to get a lot of pushback because it is going to have an impact on the economy. And let me say one more thing. When we have gigantic polluters like China and India... You know, we're giving them potentially an unfair advantage on the economic front by us having to do these things related to our climate. Yeah, it's a good two part question. I'll, I'll take that last part first. I think, you know, part of the Biden administration wanting to rejoin some of these multilateral agreements is it gives us some more authority to try and get uh, China and India that are huge polluters um, in line with what we want to see happen uh, on the world stage. We're four percent of the world's population, but we're 20 percent of the world's uh, pollution that we see. So we're a big contributor to that. Obviously, India and China are also big when it comes to that. So I think you know, you're know you seeing a Biden approach that's obviously more multilateral. We can uh, hold folks to account if we rejoin things like that. But you know, to the original uh, thrust of, of your question, um, Dan, is in the past, I think Democrats have failed to tout some of the job benefits of moving forward in a, in a more green kind of direction with the economy. It's always been framed in, in that kind of one, two jobs versus uh, uh, climate, which has failed us in the past because it's a great argument, right? You have a thousand jobs that were just cut overnight with the Keystone XL pipeline, and that's a really effective uh, argument to be made against canceling that contract. But if you talk about the jobs of the future, if you talk about the fact that in the last three months of the Trump administration, we lost 37,000 manufacturing jobs uh, to overseas companies. Um, I think if you take things in perspective um, as a whole of the economy, I, I think we're better off when we talk about that trade off because it is a delicate balancing act. And we've got to get better as Democrats and, and people that believe in, in the climate crisis to talking about the job component of this. And it can't happen overnight. These folks that uh, lost their positions uh, with Keystone XL aren't now going to be able to install solar panels tomorrow. Um, but I think what you saw out of uh, John Kerry and Gina McCarthy, our, our kind of domestic and international climate point people in the administration are, you know, how do we in, encourage and empower folks within their to move into jobs that are um, that are climate focused, not having to move themselves physically, but how can we uh, encourage companies to move in that direction within these cities and municipalities? So it is a, a difficult trade off. Um, but again, I, I think if we do our best level work to to not uh, emphasize that trade-off, I think we're, we're going to be better off as Democrats. Along the lines of jobs, let's talk about minimum wage. Th this has been a big issue across the country. And, of course, Joe Biden would like to see a federal $15 per hour uh, wage increase or, or minimum wage. Sure. And I, I think there's, I think there's a, a few issues here. First... I think we're all in favor of not having people below the poverty line. So we want people to be able to make a living and be able to support themselves. But the issue of minimum wage, I think, is a little bit different in my view, because minimum wage to me is, is not really in place to have people uh, make a living. It, it's really a starting point to be able to move up. So the, the impact of an immediate raise in the uh, minimum wage, I would think, is going to cost some jobs because small businesses and many businesses are not going to be able to afford it, number one. And then the question becomes, even if it gets absorbed by businesses, do they end up passing that cost to the consumer and ultimately who gets hurt the most by that type of inflation are the minimum wage workers. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting conversation to have. I mean, I, I look at, you know, places like Maryland and Virginia. I, I live in Washington, D.C. that have seen increases, at least on the state level, um, that are doing very well. Right. So uh, I, I think you want to set a goal and you want to push push states in, in that direction. 
uh, to do a, a, a minimum wage increase. I've, I've seen interesting polling that, you know, you look at Trump uh, voters under uh, that make under fifty thousand uh, dollars a year. Uh, Forty percent of them actually support increasing the minimum wage. So I think there's interesting tie-in tie-ins that aren't necessarily uh, among uh, partisan lines, uh, but it is something to study. I think it is something to encourage. You know, I think there are a number of people uh, in this country that, because of uh, whatever s situation they find themselves in, whether it's you know uh, education access, uh, what have you, are in jobs that do not increase uh, in terms of wages. Uh, over the course of 10, 20, 30 years. I, I do understand the idea that it should be an entry point in terms of minimum wage. And a lot of those folks don't you know, stay uh, working at places like McDonald's, working at places uh, like Walmart, what have you, that are more entry level positions. Uh, but for a vast majority of, of, of uh, blue collar workers, you still see uh, those wage increases not happening uh, on the local uh, and state level. And I, I think it's something to shoot for uh, despite the trade offs. Kevin, uh, I'd love to shift gears and talk health care with you for a moment. You know, President Biden has already stated that he wants to create a new public option to increase access to the health insurance market. And and certainly, I think on both sides of the aisle, we could agree that, uh, you know, we want people to have insurance and access to the health care system. And, and the uninsured is a challenge uh, for our nation. But what the Affordable Care Act failed to do, in my opinion, as someone who's followed the health care sector most of his career, is it really failed to focus on the fundamental problem of the rising cost of health care? Uh, and that's the health care that is delivered, right? Health insurance and the rising cost of premiums is really a derivative of that. And so we have a cost problem, not just with health insurance premiums, but what's causing that, which is the cost of health care. So how are Democrats, and more specifically President Biden, going to address the rising cost of that which is delivered, which is health care, not just offer up subsidies uh, to buy health insurance premiums for people? Yes, yeah, Seth, it's a great question. You know, I, you, you saw some executive actions uh, last week around uh, health care in terms of uh, uh, reopening the enrollment period to get more folks in that market. We saw about 850,000 more Americans filed for unemployment uh, insurance uh, within the last week. Uh, so much of our health care is tied to, uh, to employment, which is also something we can talk about in terms of maybe that's problematic in terms of how people access uh, health care and how that's so related to, to job uh, access. Um, but it's a good question. I, you know, one of the, the largest uh, cost concerns is, of course, around drug, uh, drug pricing. Um, so I think you're going to see a Biden administration, uh, like the Trump administration, that really wanted to deliver on drug pricing, for example, move forward with abilities to negotiate. Uh, drug pricing when it comes to Medicaid and Medicare and cracking down on that, which is one component of why uh, health care costs are skyrocketing is, is drug drug costs in this country. Um, so I think that's one tangible thing that Republicans can get on board with, just as Democrats were uh, with President Trump. And hopefully we can see some legislation on that front, especially uh, with COVID and uh, now hopefully moving this country away from COVID as we head into the spring, head into the summer. Um, in terms of refocusing health care, not so much on the crisis at hand, but how do we secure uh, health care for the future? Kevin, uh, as we think about health care and many of the other big agenda items for President Biden going forward, uh, one has to start talking about the deficit. And, and I will say, neither party has done a great job of this over the years, right? Republicans love to run on the deficit, but when they get to Washington, it kind of goes by the wayside. So. You know, how does either party, but specifically the Democrat Party, focus and deal with the rising deficit uh, as it continues to grow, especially as, as uh, President Biden considers all these new initiatives that he wants to roll out? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great question. I mean, debt and deficit spending, we saw, you know, $7 trillion added to our, our national debt in just the last four years. And both parties, you know, are out of control when it comes to spending. Now, I look at what, you know, Jerome Powell is saying in terms of the Fed chair. Uh, that he uh, has gotten to the end of his tools and his toolbox to stimulate the economy. Certainly, he wants to see the, the COVID crisis get under control. And you saw Janet Yellen, our new Treasury Secretary, saying, let's go big. Uh, because, again, I think we're still in the throes of uh, this economic crisis, not just this health crisis. We saw our worst economic year last year in terms of 2020 since 1946. Um, so there is a lot, I think, that can be done in terms of stimulating the economy. But, you know, to your question, Seth, it all comes out of cost, right? We're borrowing from our future, our children's future, um, and, and in terms of, of tax payment. So I think what you're going to see out of the Biden administration uh, that we didn't see out of the Trump administration necessarily is 
what are the pay fors here? Okay, so you want to spend this money. You want to give uh, direct stimulus uh, checks to the American people. You want to uh, increase funding for schools so that they can reopen, uh, increase vaccine distributions. How are you going to pay for it? Um, because again, we can't just mortgage our future. Uh, and it is getting to an untenable point. But again, I, I think, you know, it is a little bit hypocritical, I think, on the Republican side. And, and to your question, I, I think it was phrased correctly that Republicans and, and Democrats really haven't cared about this. So now we're seeing some of these Republicans come forward and now all they want to do is talk about the debt and deficit two weeks into the, the Biden administration. I think that's fundamentally, fundamentally wrong because we didn't hear from them uh, for the last four years when they were uh, ballooning out of control. But hopefully we'll, we'll see some pay fors at least with the Biden administration going forward. Kevin, let's talk about Wall Street. There, there's been uh, a lot of headlines related to a company that most people were not paying attention to, and all of a sudden it became the biggest name in the financial markets, and that's GameStop, right? So we're, what we're really seeing there, in my view, is, is much more of a systemic problem behind the headlines, and that relates to market manipulation. Now, there have been many Democrats, in particular Elizabeth Warren, that has complained about how Wall Street operates and the fat cats and all that other stuff. And what we saw with this GameStop is we, we perceive anyway that the little guy kind of fought back against the big bad hedge funds. And, and the hedge funds have taken a big hit and perhaps they deserved it. But the question really goes to this. Will there be more regulations? Are more regulations needed? How do you think the Biden administration is going to react to what's happening? Because it doesn't seem this, this, this type of manipulation is over with. Yeah, it's a really good question. I, you know, I think we're still in the early stages of grappling with this, uh, just in the last two weeks or so, uh, with this uh, kind of almost hacking of uh, the stock market by this democratization of just, you know, small users, you know, putting in very small amounts, but driving up that that cost. Um, I think you're seeing, you know, indications that Maxine Waters, who chairs the Financial Services Committee uh, and her Republican counterpart, uh, the ranking member, are interested in moving on with hearings about this uh, because it does pose a lot of concerns uh, to the industry itself. Industries are based on confidence. And when you have things like this that shake the core confidence of our economic markets, it's hugely problematic. And it's not a partisan issue. I think, again, you're seeing uh, Chairwoman uh, Waters uh, wanting to move forward, whether it's regulations, certainly a hearing at least uh, to see uh, you know, what the experts are saying and what kind of remedies are. Oftentimes what we've seen is an overcompensation, especially on the part of Democrats when we see something like this. I think it's more important to get to the bottom of it in those open hearings to assess and to, to figure out a way to build that confidence in, in the markets itself. Kevin, if history has taught us anything, it's that in recent years, presidents whose parties have control of both houses often still have a hard time getting more than one major piece of legislation across the finish line. As in the case with President Obama, obviously it was the Affordable Care Act. And then with President Trump, it was the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, what do you think, if, if there's one thing uh, that President Joe Biden's gonna, gonna fight for uh, in the early days here, what do you think that's going to be? Yeah, Seth, I think it's going to be this this uh, 1.9 trillion dollar COVID package, right? So, you know, we talked about Jerome Powell. He says he's out of, uh, you know, tools in his toolkit to to revive the economy. It is shrinking. We saw again the worst year uh, in in terms of economic growth in in more than 70 years uh, last year. So, I, I think for his legacy uh, is going to be riding the ship and be, uh, passing this in the uh, in the next weeks at least by, by uh, you know, mid-February to, to late February, I think is what you're seeing out of this administration. Uh, and then hopefully you'll see, you know, maybe a pivot to um, uh, investments in infrastructure, transportation. Uh, we're seeing, you know, you saw last week uh, uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg uh, uh, secure the position of Secretary of Transportation, working very closely with the administration to move forward that kind of package, bringing Republicans into the fold on, on that. Uh, potentially, we always talk about it always being infrastructure week in Washington, D.C. Well, maybe we'll actually get a bipartisan deal on that. Uh, but again, I think out of the out of the gate, the, the premier focus is, of course, that that rescue package. Interesting. Well, I guess we'll all just kind of have to wait and see. But uh, we got a lot 
to look forward to in the days and weeks to come to see what's going to happen out of the, the new administration. Kevin, man, I got to tell you, I can understand now why the president picked you as a campaign surrogate. <laughs> you certainly are articulate and, and put across his message very well. We appreciate you being a guest here on the BizPo Show and want to invite you to come back anytime. I'd love to, Seth. Dan, thank you so much for the conversation. Hey, thank you. Hey, so let me make one more oh. point, Seth. Okay. Let me make one more point. Kevin is from New Jersey. <laughs> New Jersey boys do well. Especially I like that. You well, got Chris go. Christie and you got Kevin Wong right there, right off the bat. It's finally, it, listen, it's Super a good thing I finally met a guy from New Jersey I like so much. That's that's a good thing, you know. <laughs> oh, I'm kidding, Dan. I'm kidding, Dan. <laughs> Kevin, hey, thanks again, buddy. Uh, again, come back and see us soon. And uh, Dan and I will be right back. Welcome back to the Biz Post Show. I got to tell you, Seth, that interview with Kevin, uh, tremendous, tremendous. There's a guy, whether Democrat or Republican, you have to respect him. And I think that we need more people like him on both sides of the yeah, aisle. Yeah, I agree, Dan. If oh, we go agree? back to our very first episode, right, and talking with Governor Christie, he was very clear that for us to get back to a place of civility, here in the U.S. where we can move the country forward. We need to start listening to one another. We need to hear what the other other side has to say. So I was, I was certainly pleased that Kevin accepted our invitation to come on board uh, the BizPo Show, and we'll look forward to having him back very soon. Uh, I would love to have him back. So listen, we got some big news that, that's going on on the, on the two coasts here, right? In California, uh, we have a Governor Newsom who has decided to open things up all of a sudden, are the are the numbers getting better? Is that the reason? And on the East Coast, in the state of New York, we have Governor Cuomo, who yeah, may be in a little bit of hot water as the attorney general of his own state is saying, hey, listen, uh, these numbers you were reporting on the deaths uh, from, from uh, COVID in the nursing homes, well, they were understated by 50%. No small number. Yeah. So, Seth, what do you think well, about listen, that? Well, listen, let's start with California, right? And, and you know, many of us were, were looking at the situation that we were finding ourselves in as a country economically and saying that, you know, the shutdowns just didn't follow the science, right? And that we needed to look at this uh, from all angles, right? It's one thing to look at this through the lens of maybe a Dr. Fauci who is looking at this as a doctor, right? And saying this is what you need to do from a medical perspective. But that's just one side of it. We have to also take into account the economic side of it and what, what impact that could have. And so as we saw really the country divided between those that were led by Republican governors uh, and mayors or those led by Democratic governors and mayors, we saw two different stories. California and Governor Gavin Newsom specifically though, was very clear that they wanted to follow the science that said that lockdowns and shutdowns would keep their people more safe. Well. Many of us were saying, let's, what happens? Is this a political ploy? And I, and I hoped it wasn't. And so first, let me say, I commend Governor Newsom for opening up. Many of us have been calling that for some time. But here's the reality. COVID deaths from the ICU are double today what they were in October in the state of California. So what has changed now for Governor Newsom that he thinks all of a sudden it's open? And for any mind that isn't trying to, to go to the place that I'm about to go, it's was this a political decision? And now that Governor Newsom is both being recalled and we have a Democrat in the White House, is that all of a sudden a reason for this change of course? It absolutely is. And I hate to go down that path as, as well, Seth, but it, it's very clear. The science was not supporting what he was doing, yet he was doing it conveniently when there was a Republican in the White House, as if it matters, because California was going to vote for the Democratic candidate, no matter who it was, against Donald Trump. So that doesn't really make sense to me, although that's what I think was happening. And, and I need to say that these poor business owners, specifically restaurants in California, where you have warm weather and they can't even serve outside, does that make any sense at all? So Governor Newsom has quite frankly punished people in his state. And the recall in my mind is well-deserved because when we talk about politics and business intersecting, 
This is exactly where it shouldn't have intersected. There was no reason to bring political issues into hurting businesses. It wasn't right. And I don't feel sorry for what he's facing politically, Seth. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, speaking of governors in hot water, you teased it at the top here. Seems like Governor Cuomo uh, may find himself in some of that as well, right? With recent numbers coming out of those that had died in nursing homes uh, being significantly more than maybe was originally stated. And his own attorney general, who I believe is a Democrat, is saying, uh, Governor, we've got a problem here. So, man, that's up in ner your neck of the woods. What's the what's the noise around the block these days? Well, a lot of people in this area, quite frankly, are upset with Governor Cuomo. You know, he was out there writing a book uh, about his uh, leadership skills, and everybody was uh, falling all over him. And, uh, and, of course, then he got an Emmy. Well, for what? I don't know. Uh, I guess it was his daily briefings. I didn't even know there was such a thing as an Emmy for that. There's an Emmy for doing your job. I don't know. Uh, maybe we should be getting one, Seth. That, that's, a, that's another story. But anyway, clearly he was uh, manipulating some uh, facts, and, and it, it didn't go unnoticed because Janice Dean, right, who, who has been after him for a long time. She's with uh, Fox News, uh, and she lost both of her in-laws on the very issue of they didn't die in a nursing home, but they were infected in a nursing home and then subsequently died. And they were not included in those numbers related to the nursing home deaths. And that's the issue at hand because it was Governor Cuomo who made the decision of putting COVID-infected people in nursing homes. Yeah, I think when the dust settles on all of this, Dan, there's going to be a lot of us that look at this. And, and again, I want to say this. It's easy to Monday morning quarterback. I wasn't the governor, uh, obviously, and, and, and not required to make those decisions. I got to know that all our leaders, Republican or Democrat, were put in some very difficult positions to make some very difficult decisions. The, the issue that I have with this is maybe the hypocrisy, but even the dishonesty. And I think Governor Cuomo was even out early on, uh, or at least as of late, calling out the Trump administration for a lack of transparency. Uh, and, and, and it seems as though, at least right now, that maybe there wasn't some transparency around this issue either. I couldn't agree more, but you know, that's politics for you, Seth. We see it all the time. It's unfortunate. These people want these jobs, they campaign for these jobs, and then they're put in tough situations and they're looking to cover things up. People will respect you far more if you're simply honest. If you make a mistake, you say you made a mistake, and then you roll out the plan for how you fix it. And too often, it's the cover up that makes you look bad. So with that said, Seth, we're going to take a quick break and come back with our final thoughts. Welcome back to the Biz Post Show. Well, if you've tuned in in previous weeks, you know that at the end of every show, Dan and I like to give you our final thoughts, something that's on our mind that we want to share with you. So, Dan, this week, buddy, what's your final thought? Well, I'll tell you what's on my mind. And I assume it's the same as so many people. How about this? I need a vacation. I really do. And uh, although I'd like to get down to Dallas, Texas to see you, I had something else in mind. Ha have you ever been to Italy, Seth? No, Dan, I, I haven't, man. <laughs> but you've been to New Jersey, and that's close. Uh, yeah. okay. But as far as how many Italians there are here. But I, I have to say, if I my final thought is I would really love to get back to Italy, specifically the Amalfi Coast. It's just absolutely gorgeous. And, and the the town, the little town of Positano, it's beach, the water, the people. And need I even say the food? That's what I really miss, the ability just to get away. I think there's so many people with COVID and everything that we've been dealing with just really want to get a little vacation. So my final thought is 
I need a vacation, Seth. I'm with you, brother. Hey, man, I, that's not my <laughs> final thought, but I think I may steal it from you. Uh, me and Mrs. Vincent were just talking about that this last week. We need a vacation. It feels like we're in extra innings on 2020 sometimes. Uh, so maybe we'll, uh, we'll join you and your missus in, in Italy at some point. Well, hey, you know, my final thought this week, uh, well, it, it kind of goes back to something we talked about at the very beginning. You know, this past week, the world outside of the investment community learned a bit more about what is known as short selling. Uh, these, uh, this investment strategy is nothing new. Shorting a stock is something that institutional investors have done for years. And the process of analyzing businesses determine their market value, well, it makes good se business sense. But large institutions certainly have more power for an accurate analysis than does maybe the day trader, which allows them, the hedge fund manager specifically, to more reliably short a stock, which is akin to a person betting against the table at a craps game because they know the dice maker. By the way, I, if you've ever played craps, Dan, but if you do that and somebody's betting against the table, that's not somebody you want to be at the table with. Well, hedge fund managers, yeah, they've, uh, they've made billions shorting stocks over the years. And, and that power imbalance has become the rallying cry of the day trader. The, we'll call them Davids versus Goliaths, which I think that you mentioned earlier on in the previous segment. You know, because the ugly thing in shorting a stock is that for someone to win, someone else has to lose and often lose big. There's nothing illegal about shorting a stock, but one can argue at times that it could be a bit immoral or even perhaps dirty. It certainly seems almost un-American to want a business to fail so that you can profit off that decline. I say it oftentimes that chickens eventually come home to roost, and last week for big hedge fund managers, that's exactly what happened. I don't know if this will ultimately change how investments are done, but it was interesting to me how quickly some came out to try to defend and maybe even save these hedge fund managers. They're big boys. They've been playing this game for a long time and they finally got a new competitor. I'm not supporting the idea of collusion or market manipulation, but I am for an even playing field. You know, David used a rock to slay his foe and in this case it seems that investors, day traders specifically, they used a cell phone. Either way, a more engaged group of investors and a more free market with free information and free flowing uh, data ultimately allows all investors of all capabilities to have the opportunity. And I'm okay with that. And that's my final thought this week. Well, listen, uh, we certainly appreciate you being part of the BizPost show this week. We hope you'll tell your friends about us and be sure to tune in next week as we'll bring you another edition of the show. From Dallas, Texas, I'm Seth Denson. And from New York City, I'm Dan Geltrude. Good night.